Today I'll be uh, talking about colon cancer screening, um, a really important topic. It was actually just colon uh, cancer awareness uh, month, last month, so I'm a little bit uh, delayed, but uh, here nonetheless, so all right. So here's a quick outline. I'll go over the cancer st statistics in the United States, the natural history of colorectal cancer, the reasoning for screening, and then the different methods of screening. Um, and then specifically focus uh, then also on kind of exceptions to some of the general screening rules and information you should take away and, and be able to discuss with your doctor and or your family. So, all right. And then just a quick disclaimer, um, the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are my own and not necessarily uh, those of UVA Medical Center and its employees. I'm happy to take questions uh, throughout at the end of the talk, however, um, I'm not, I'm not your doctor, so I won't give specific uh, medical advice. Um, so please address those you know, with your uh, regular doctor. Um, and uh, yeah, all right. So colorectal cancer in the United States is the third most common cancer. Uh, it has the second highest, uh, it's the second highest cause of cancer death behind only lung cancer. Um, 150,000 new cases are diagnosed per year and there are also 50,000 deaths per year. Um, in their lifetime, one in 23 men will be diagnosed and one in 25 women uh, will be diagnosed. So obviously a very important cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States. Um, this is just an overview um, of the anatomy of the colon. Um, so the large intestine com uh, comprises the colon, which is about five feet long, and the rectum, uh, which is the final six inches, as well as the anus. So we'll be talking about cancer of this region. Um, the natural history of colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer starts out as a polyp, which is just a collection of cells on the colon lining or mucosa. Uh, polyps themselves are not cancerous. Uh, they're benign as we call them, but a small proportion, uh, less than 10%, uh, can develop into cancer over time. Uh, and that is on the order of 10 to 20 years typically. Um, this is just a representation of, of what uh, polyps are and kind of the stages they go through in their growth. Um, so you can see on the, on the left hand side of the, the graph, um, you have the adenomatous polyps, uh, the small polyps, and then they can become large over time. And large polyp in this context is a centimeter or bigger. Um, and then the polyps, as they grow, they can uh, develop dysplasia within them, which are abnormal uh, cells. Um, and then if they're left there uh, and not taken out, uh, that can go on to become adenocarcinoma. And then again, if that's left there and not discovered, that can um, proceed to invasive cancer, uh, which is when we worry about metastasis. Um, so once polyps develop into cancers that invade into the wall, um, there's a risk of spread to the lymph nodes and other organs, like I said, um, thus metastasizing. If it's discovered early, uh, the rate of survival is still up to 90% at five years. Um, so important to find this early. Um, as far as the reasoning for screening, I've been kind of alluding to that, um, but screening and early detection quite simply save lives. Um, diagnosis of colorectal cancer has declined significantly in the last uh, 30 years, which is partly attributed to decreased risk factors such as smoking, but also to the increased, uh, increased uptake of screening that started in about the year 2000. Um, and then mortality has also significantly declined in the last three decades. Um, a more, majority of that decline is attributed to increased screening. Um, so this is just another um, kind of representation of, of, um, of the colon and it's showing specifically a polyp. And this is a colonoscope. So what would be used during a colonoscopy. And this is just demonstrating that we can kind of snare them off, kind of lasso off the polyps. Um, and then, like I said, you know, that much easier to take care of at that stage than uh, when it's progressed to cancer. So fairly, fairly simple and straightforward uh, for a gastroenterologist. 
So there are multiple types of screening these days. So um, there are two different categories. So there's one-step screening methods and two-step screening methods. Uh, the only uh, one-step screening method is a colonoscopy. And it's one step because it's both uh, diagnostic and therapeutic. So like I showed on the previous screen, we can take out polyps. Um, so it's, you know, you find it and you take it out. Um, there are multiple two-step screening methods and several have been developed in the last uh, decade or so. And these are less invasive in general, uh, but if they're positive, then the second step would be to do a colonoscopy. Um, so the advantage is, yeah, less invasive, don't have to go through a procedure, but you might still have to end up needing a procedure if that's positive. All right. So in 2021, this year, um, the recommendations were updated um, and some of the things they recommended, so colonoscopy and then FIT test, which is one of the two-step methods we'll talk about, uh, were the only recommended primary screening methods. Um, there are other methods, like I'll mention, that are kind of reserved for people that uh, either can't or, or won't undergo colonoscopy or do a FIT test. Uh, the newest guidelines uh, recommend screening for average risk patients from the age of 45 to 75 years old. Um, 45 is a change from previous guidelines recommending starting at age 50. There's been an increase in the, um, the incidence of colon cancer in people younger than 50. So that has driven the guidelines to reduce the starting screening age to 45. And then after age 75, it's generally recommended um, to discuss with your doctor and kind of uh, everyone, the decision should be made basically on an individual basis as far as whether you should continue the screening uh, methods um, based on uh, kind of prior procedures and family history and that kind of thing, as well as overall health. Um, so if there's a family history of colon cancer or advanced polyps, then uh, the recommendations may be different, which we'll discuss later. And advanced polyps are polyps greater than a centimeter um, or with certain findings under the microscope um, that suggests higher risk. So, all right, so we've kind of talked about colonoscopy already, but as I mentioned, it's the one one-step uh, screening method for colon cancer. Um, if no polyps are found, uh, the general recommendation is that colonoscopy should occur every 10 years. Um, and if, if polyps are found, depending on the number and the type of polyps, then uh, your doctor may recommend more frequent screening. And I already kind of mentioned this, but advanced adenoma as a polyp that's a centimeter or greater and has certain findings under the microscope, such as dysplasia or abnormal cell growth. So that could, uh, again, prompt um, closer follow-up and potentially family needing to get screened earlier. So we'll come back to that here in a bit. So advantages of colonoscopy, again, it's one step um, and there's a possibility at least of several years between um, the screening test. Disadvantages um, include the bowel preparation uh, going through that and then sedation since it's an, a procedure as well as the risk of complications. Uh, serious complications like perforation or a hole in the colon and bleeding happen on the order of four to eight in 10,000 procedures. So rare, but if they happen, could be serious. Um, <clears throat> like I mentioned, there are several two-step screening tests, and some of these are still pretty new in the sense that we don't have great long-term data on kind of how well they do and how frequently they should be done. Um, but some of those include stool tests, like I mentioned, the FIT test, fecal immunochemical test, um, and then the multi-targeted stool DNA test, uh, also known as Coligard, uh, you may have heard of, um, and then procedures um, it, one is called the flexible sigmoidoscopy, and that's essentially kind of like a colonoscopy, except just a third of the colon, the in third of the colon. Um, and then there are imaging techniques as well, and some of these are still kind of in development as far as how effective they are, but one is CT colonography and then a colon capsule uh, that is essentially a video camera in, in capsule form. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, along with colonoscopy, uh, FIT test is the other recommended primary uh, screening method, um, and the FIT test should be done annually. Um, this basically, this test uses antibodies directed at hemoglobin uh, to detect blood in the stool, um, so it requires a submission of stool sample. Um, it is about 80% sensitive for detection of col colorectal cancer. So not perfect, not a perfect screening test, um, but picks up, 
you know, about 80% of, of colorectal cancer. Um, less detection of those advanced polyps that I mentioned. So it could be that people have advanced polyps and get a negative fit test. Um, so that is one possible disadvantage. And then like all uh, two-step tests, if this is positive, then a colono colonoscopy sh should be done to follow that up uh, to see um, if there are polyps or cancer. Um, and then other screening methods, um, as I mentioned, the colonoscopy and then annual fit tests are the primary screening recommendations, but um, the way it's put in the guidelines, if people are unwilling or unable to do those methods, then some of these other tests are, are um, recommended um, instead. So the multi-target stool DNA test, which you may have heard of, it's called Coligard. Um, it basically combines the FIT test as well as a DNA test um, of the stool. So it detects DNA mutations um, that are shed from cells uh, from polyps and cancer. Um, it is a newer test. So like I said, there's less kind of longitudinal long-term data about this and kind of, um, you know, the utility of this and how accurate it is. Um, but currently the, the recommendation is if you're gonna use this to do this every three years. Um, it does detect advanced adenomas that we had talked about um, more, more frequently than FIT test alone, but there are also more false positive tests in general, which results in more colonoscopies um, without any finding of polyps. So um, that is one disadvantage of that test. And then um, I'll go over these kind of briefly, uh, but flexible sigmoidoscopy I already mentioned, that's a procedure still, but usually requires less sedation or sometimes no sedation. And then just an enema, so not the full bowel prep uh, that you drink. Uh, and this examines the last third of the colon. So if you remember that picture, it's like the sigmoid and left side of the colon. Um, and this is generally recommended to repeat every five to 10 years. It's less invasive um, than a colonoscopy, but still requires prep. And then, of course, if you, you know, you're only looking at a third of the colon, so you're not seeing two thirds of it. But if it were positive, meaning polyps are found or cancer is found, then you would need to get a colonoscopy after that. And then CT colonography, um, not every center does this. Um, it's an insurance may variably cover this, but essentially this is a CT scan um, after you've had carbon dioxide kind of infused into the colon. Um, and it does require a bowel prep as well uh, to detect the polyps and cancer, uh, but it is very sensitive for colon cancer, uh, but less sensitive for smaller, smaller polyps. Uh, and again, if this is positive, then colonoscopy would be recommended as the next step. Um, all right. Um, as I mentioned before, so the general recommendations um, um, that we talked about sometimes do not apply in the case of uh, family history of colorectal cancer or advanced polyps. So um, if one or more first degree family member has been diagnosed with colon cancer or an advanced adenoma at age 60 or younger, then um, and or you have two or more second degree family members uh, with colon cancer or advanced adenoma at any age, it's recommended that you get a colonoscopy at age 40 or 10 years before the earliest affected family member was diagnosed and then repeating every five years. So a lot of these newer tests that are um, the two-step tests um, are, are not really recommended in these cases where people may have uh, higher risk um, of developing colon cancer. Um, because they, you might be at higher risk and the, the regular guidelines basically just don't apply or we don't really know how effective they are um, at, at picking up uh, cancer and advanced adenomas in these patients. So colonoscopy would be the screening method of choice in these, these patients. Um, so now uh, I'll just kind of mention important things that you might want to discuss with your doctor regarding um, colonoscopy or colon cancer screening. Um, if you have prior colonoscopy reports, it's very helpful to bring that uh, to the doctor's office. Um, and it can kind of help dictate, you know, the frequency that you should be screened, especially if you move somewhere, it's helpful to have that information in hand or make sure it's sent ahead of your appointment to be able to discuss that in more um, kind of in a more tailored fashion. And then also bringing up and knowing your family history of colon cancer and, and these advanced polyps um, is very helpful. Um, and then knowing and mentioning any family or personal history of other cancers can be important um, because there are certain hereditary cancer syndromes that exist 
and genetic testing may be possible uh, or indicated in those cases. So, and then information to discuss with your family. So we've kind of mentioned family history quite a bit. Um, and I do feel that, you know, patients and doctors don't necessarily always do a great job of communicating, you know, what's an advanced adenoma and should you tell your family and how much, you know, should you tell your family or how worried should they be? Um, so that's a good thing to talk to your doctor about too, if, if you've had polyps found. But uh, it's important to discuss first and second degree relatives uh, history of cancer, as we mentioned, or advanced polyps. Um, and then talk to children and siblings about your own history of cancer and um, advanced polyps so that they, they can also make informed decisions about their risks. Um, so those would be kind of my take homes for uh, what to discuss. All right, and then this is actually a really great website. I think they had just uh, updated it um, in March for the colon cancer awareness uh, month, but gi.org slash colon cancer um, is a great website that has really good, um, easy to digest uh, information. And that's it. Wow. Well, I thank you so much. That was a lot of good information. I'm and I didn't go too fast. <laughs> well, we'll find out, I guess. <laughs> I don't think so at all. Um, I have several questions, but yeah. um, I've unmuted folks. So if you want to ask questions, you can just um, either put them in the chat or you can ask Lauren, whatever you would like to do. You can unmute yourself and ask. And um, while yeah. folks are thinking about that, I, I had a, a couple of questions um, about the Cologuard test. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my doctor told me that, you know, that test, detects, like you said, the DNA mutations or uh, blood in the stool. Mm -hmm. But the problem he said was that, let's say you have one of those two things occur and you get a result in the mail and it says, oh, you know, inconclusive. Right. Um, and then you go get a colonoscopy. Uh, the doctor who was a colonoscopy person said, they don't tell us, the Cologuard people, which one it was. Oh. But have you heard that before? As far as which was positive DNA versus... Or, yeah, I don't think they, any report I've ever seen is just positive or negative, basically. Yeah, yeah. Which is very, for, so from the time you get that to the time you go for a colonoscopy, it can be a worrying time. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It really can. Yeah, that, that is definitely, you know, a potential um, disadvantage of some of the two-step tests is, yeah, the waiting period and just kind of you know, um, yeah, mentally preparing yourself for colonoscopy and just what that might show. So yeah, definitely the worry and concern that that can generate could, could be a major disadvantage. And then if it shows nothing, that's great. But yeah, you still have that period of time where you were very concerned. So um, yeah, definitely be a disadvantage. And I see Tom in the uh, chat. Can you see the chat, Lauren, or I can read uh, it to you? I think I, hmm, let's see. Oh, I think I can now. Yeah, sorry. Okay, um, let's see. It says male, yes, okay, yeah. Yep. So male age 67, full colonoscopy with no polyps, uh, 10 years would be 77 and then no further tests per guidelines. Yeah, that's correct. Um, technically past 75, uh, the guidelines recommend, you know, a discussion with your doctor about whether or not, you know, doing another colonoscopy makes sense. Um, but generally, yes, that would, that would be the recommendation. So, but in people with like really, you know, um, advanced diseases at, at that age, you know, it may be kind of a risk benefit. It's always a risk benefit analysis, but at that point it might be, um, oh, thank you. Um, no, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It might be, um, you know, more risk than benefit potentially. So definitely talk to your doctor though. Um, okay. Lauren, I have a question. Yeah. Sure. Is uh, colon cancer caused by HPV? No, colon cancer is not. Anal, um, anal, anal cancer can be. Um, that is a risk factor for anal cancer, but not colon cancer itself, as far as we know. Is anal cancer under the umbrella of colon cancer? S sort of, um, but I would say it's it's technically different um, because of the way it's it's treated differently in the way that the oncologists approach it and that kind of thing. So it's the anus is part of the large intestine, but it's 
technically, yeah, it's it's kind of a separate entity um, altogether. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. I see a couple others in the in the chat. Do you want me to? Sure. Okay. Um, for people with restricted fluid intake, is there an alternative method such as taking pills uh, to doing the enema? Um, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. There's not a pill. Um, if I could admit that, I, I would be very wealthy. <laughs> um, but, and then enemas, the enemas are more for um, like a flexible sigmoidoscopy, so just the end part of the colon. But for the colonoscopy itself, the prep, there's the Go Lightly, which is the main um, prep that we use. There is a prep called Su Prep um, that is less volume than the Go Lightly that sometimes we'll use in people that have trouble like hyponatremia or kidney issues or other things where they have volume issues um, that uh, is less volume. It's still a decent amount. I can't remember exactly how much it comes out to, but I think it's at least you know, half or less than the Go Lightly, which is the huge, huge jug of four liters. Um, so it's, it's less than that, but it's still a decent amount. So yeah, currently not a pill that, that we have right now. So unfortunately. Uh, Dom has another question in the chat. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, Okay, so Cleveland Clinic used to recommend increasing fiber intake to avoid colon cancer. Is that still the case? And if so, how much daily fiber and what type of fiber? Good question. Um, you know, it, it's, I don't think it's necessarily um, a, a major thing that we emphasize anyway. I think we generally as gastroenterologists just promote kind of um, the standard amount of fiber intake, um, just in your daily diet, like from vegetables and that kind of thing. Um, I don't think it would hurt, um, to, to get more fiber intake as far as decreasing, you know, colon cancer risk, but it, it's not a huge amount. And there's certainly not kind of a, you must get this amount to prevent colon cancer, um, kind of recommendation that I have. But if um, you're not able to get dietary uh, fiber as much, then things like Citrusel and Metamucil are things that we'll advise um, to, to um, patients um, in general about fiber intake, so. Okay, and then I got a message uh, that says, can you explain how staging is determined in colon cancer and are most cancers found at the highest stages? Um, so that is a little bit more um, specific, I would say, to the on oncologist. So I'll, I'll do my best and kind of give a, a general um, overview of that. But um, of course, um, getting biopsies with the, the colonoscopy is, is very helpful um, to get the tissue and kind of be able to see if we can uh, tell how deep it's invading. Um, but usually that's not the best method for kind of telling you know, the stage. Um, so imaging, uh, CT scan generally is kind of where we'll start uh, CT of the abdomen and sometimes the chest as well to see if there's any metastasis. And it can also help kind of see any enlarged lymph nodes. Uh, we can't tell from that if those definitely have cancer, but I would say that honestly, the part of the staging is, is uh, when the surgeons do surgery to take out part of the colon or take out um, yeah, take out part of the colon so they can uh, assess lymph nodes, they can recite lymph nodes, and then <clears throat> that can be used um, um, to help determine the stage. And then most cancers found at high stage. I don't know the percentages exactly, but I, I know that, you know, it's the percentages of colon cancer being found in early stages has definitely increased in the last 20 to 30 years, which um, is part of the reason that the mortality has gone down. But I, I would say, I think I remember a number, uh, don't quote me, but it, at least a third are found like in the earliest stages. Um, it's pretty rare these days um, to find the higher stages, especially if people have had screening uh, before, so. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say there's the question, what is the preferred sedative used in the oh, procedure? Yeah, good question. So um, there are different, um, there are different sedation methods for colonoscopy. So there is one 
uh, called moderate sedation. Um, so that is essentially given by the nurses in the procedure room um, and the doctors, the gastroenterologists kind of help direct how much to give, uh, but that is Versed and fentanyl. So Versed is kind of an anti-anxiety medication. Um, it's all given IV and then fentanyl is, a, is an opiate um, IV medication. Um, so it's kind of helps sedate um, and cause pain relief, that kind of thing. Um, but people are usually sort of in a twilight uh, sleep. So you're still, some people can be more with it than others. Uh, some people still sleep through the whole thing, but others will kind of be looking at the screen and we can kind of show them what we're, what we're seeing, and, but they're still relaxed and you know, not uncomfortable. And we can always adjust and give more if we need to. Um, and then the other method um, is um, called uh, monitored anesthesia care or MAC. And that is, is directed from the anesthesiologist and the nurse anesthetist. Um, so people that are trained in giving uh, those specific uh, medications and that's propofol. Um, so propofol is, is quick on and quick off, but it is deeper uh, sedation than Versed and fentanyl. Um, and so people generally are not awake during the procedure, but you're still what we call protecting your airway. So it's not general anesthesia, which is where you would need a tube down uh, in, in your respiratory system to help you breathe. Um, propofol is less than that, but more than the moderate sedation. So did that answer that question? Okay. Um, and then, sorry, uh, going back, there was, um, can you spell the name of the alternative prep mentioned for um, people that need less volume uh, prep? It's called SUPREP, S-U-P-R-E-P. Um, and the only problem with that uh, preparation is that sometimes insurance companies won't cover it. Um, so that, that's why we don't always prescribe that. <laughs> um, usually the preferred one is go lightly, uh, like I mentioned. However, during the pandemic, um, among many things that have been uh, not predicted, um, there has been a shortage of go lightly. So I think the insurance companies have been making some exceptions, uh, some of them, but insurance companies are difficult for me to figure out. <laughs> uh, so I don't know exactly who and, and uh, how much reduced, um, but yes, uh, Suprep, it would be nice if we could give everyone that. I think everyone would appreciate that, but. Um, all right. I have a question that I'm curious about. The um, colon, about how wide is it and is it is it soft? I mean, what's the makeup? I'm sure you've seen one, right? Yeah, yeah. I've done about 150 colonoscopies myself, oh. going on 200. Yeah, um, yes, yeah. So it, it's um, it's it's mucosa. It's soft, um, and it's it's you know it looks straight in the pictures, but it's kind of windy, windier than uh, the pictures make it look like. Um, and it's about, I think, uh, two, two and a half centimeters kind of wide at most parts that can kind of vary uh, depending on where you are. But uh, we use uh, carbon dioxide um, during the colonoscopy to see uh, better. Um, used to be kind of general air um, that we would use during the colonoscopy, um, but that's not absorbed quite as quickly and people have more cramps. So the carbon dioxide mm -hmm. helps us see, but it's absorbed pretty quickly and you breathe it off. Um, mm -hmm. and and um, yeah, so um, soft, um, definitely more twisty than it looks in the pictures <laughs> and um, about five feet long. Uh, yeah. Do some people have a longer uh, colonoscopy than, uh, I mean, yeah, colon than other? Good question. I don't know if it's technically longer or just kind of twisty and what we call redundant. Um, so it's just kind of a lot of tissue um, kind of on top of each other, so to speak. So, and twistier, um, a lot, a lot of people can have twistier colons. It tends to be, uh, older, older women that have had like any sort of abdominal or pelvic, uh, surgeries can kind of have twistier colons. Um, so yeah. And taller people have more redundant colons, uh, I would say so in general. Oh, I have a question. Sure. Yeah, I had my first and only colonoscopy about 15 to 20 years ago. Okay. They found three polyps, but on, on um, examination of them, they said these were not the kind of polyps that turned into cancer, so yeah. to come back in 10 years. Yeah. So 10 years later, I had a new doctor, uh -huh. but uh, I had passed the 70-year-old or 75-year-old 
mark. And so I had, I think, a, a fit test, something, and I, it was negative. And so they didn't recommend any further discovery or anything else. I'm now 83. Is that a good recommendation? I, I think so. That based on the information okay, I have, uh, yeah. no family history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yeah. They, that sounds like that was the right recommendation. There are polyps that we find that sometimes it can be hard to tell whether they're adenomatous, which are the ones that could become go on to become cancer, or what we call hyperplastic, uh, which are basically they no malignant potential unless they're really big. Um, so, so yeah, based on, on what, um, information you were given, um, that sounds like that was the right recommendation. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you. You're done. <laughs> One good thing's about getting older. Right. <laughs> Lauren. Yeah. I am wondering if there's any correlation between dry particulitis and, uh, further issues. My son, Hugh is having to re undergo a resection because he waited for about five days from the beginning of diverticulitis. It was over a weekend. Yeah. And there is perforation. Yeah. So, so I'm one, and he is going, he's going to have a procedure, but I'm just wondering about correlation between serious issues. Yeah, not as far as I know. Um, not, not, I guess, in the sense that, um, that you're asking. So diverticulitis itself does not necessarily make you more at risk of getting colon cancer, as far as I know. However, in people that have had diverticulitis, um, especially if they haven't had any uh, colonoscopy recently, we'll usually recommend doing a colonoscopy after things have kind of cooled off. Um, um, to make sure, because rarely, um, I would, I've never seen this myself, but um, it's kind of in our recommendations, rarely like an obstructing tumor or polyp could cause um, the diverticula, which is the outpouching of the colon that can happen as we get older. It can cause that to be obstructed and then have the inflammation or infection of that. And so we generally recommend doing colonoscopy after someone has had diverticulitis um, mm -hmm. to see, make sure they don't have any masses or anything that could yeah. be contributing to that. Yeah. That will be an adventure for him because he has latent factor five. Oh yeah. And needs to go off the Coumadin Yes. In order yep. to have the, yes. the colonoscopy. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's a good point you bring up. People on anticoagulation, um, definitely talk to your doctor about, you know, before any procedure, but in this case, colonoscopy about um, how long you need to be off of that. Um, and then if, you know, after the procedure, um, depending on what they find or if they take out anything, you may be able to start back right away or you may need yeah. to wait um, if they took out something big. So definitely always good to bring that up with your doctor. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, thank you. I had another question about whether vegetarians get colon cancer less often, which is a intriguing <laughs> and good question. Um, so um, I don't know the, the stats or like whether there have been any um, direct studies on that, but Definitely there have been associations of red uh, meat, processed foods, that kind of thing with uh, development of, of colon cancer. So I can only assume that the opposite might be, might be true, but I don't know that for a fact, but um, eating you know, significant amounts of red, red meat can um, put you at higher risk, we think, of colon cancer. Hmm. So. Well, I have another curiosity question. Sure. Is there any correlation between uh, colon cancer and the other, some of the other abdominal illnesses, syndromes like irritable bowel or Crohn's or? or yeah, great question. Yeah, so um, inflammatory bowel disease, which includes Crohn's, Crohn's um, and ulcerative colitis. Right. Those, yeah. those patients, uh, those people need to get more frequent screening um, because yes, they are at higher risk due to inflammation. IBS is um, not really inflammation in the sense of the mucosa being inflamed of the colon. It's kind of the nerves and um, the nerve connections to the brain kind of being disrupted. Um, so no increased risk in those cases, but definitely inflammatory bowel disease is a, is a risk factor for sure. Okay, good. good. 
Um, I had another question um, and it's the, you know, probably the one thing that for me before I was recommended to have my first colonoscopy really scared me was the whole issue of possible perforation. Yes. And yeah. um, you know, it, I'm still not really um, thrilled that it's eight in 10,000. Um, yeah. You know, I'd like it to be zero in a million. Sure. sure. Um, and um, I'm wondering if, if, if they have, any correlations or even maybe a causation between why that happens? You know, is it age? Is it severity of, is it the person operating the equipment? What, what? Kind of all of the above from, from what I understand. Yeah, it, it is very rare and knock on wood, I have never caused one or seen one. Um, so, but yes, it's certainly kind of the dreaded consequence. And I would say definitely people with those twistier colons, it can be a little bit uh, higher risk. Um, so yeah, if they say tortuous, that kind of thing, um, colon, then that can be higher risk. The, um, the experience of the um, person doing the scope is definitely a, um, a factor. Um, as far as other specific risk factors, none that I've heard of except people with like Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, anything kind of inflammatory like that um, are at higher risk. Um, so all of those are risk factors. Um, that being said, yeah, it does happen very rarely. Um, the risk of colon cancer is higher for what it's worth. Um, but then also if it happens, it's not always, not always surgical uh, fix. There are ways to fix it kind of endoscopically with clips and that kind of thing. So I've heard of that happening before where it's repaired with clips and there were no further kind of downstream consequences or need for resection of the colon. Um, that's not always the case, but, um, or sometimes it will just be kind of watched and monitored um, if it's really small. Um, but yes, it's, it is kind of one of the risks for sure. So. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else, any questions, comments? I, yeah, I have another one, of course. <laughs> I've had far too many colonoscopies over the years, and I really hate go lightly. Yes. I gotta tell you, <laughs> I really hate that. Uh, there was a period of time when I used to have more colonoscopies. I'm 84 now. I don't have any more. Do I? Yeah. You graduated. Tell me I don't need any more. No, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> but For old times sake. Uh, there was a period of time where they used a fleet enema. Yeah. And then that wasn't done anymore. Yeah. But I'm wondering if the people who, uh, I don't think people at Go Lightly have taken a lot of Go Lightly. <laughs> it's a bitch. Yeah, that's, that's what I hear. I, they, they use, I, I don't know if, I don't know how official this is, or this is just a rumor, but when, when things like that used to be more kind of on the shelf and around and we didn't have to kind of, you know, have prescriptions per se, whatnot, fellows used to be told to try it out, at least a sip, just so they know <laughs> what they're giving people, uh, what torture um, they're giving people. So, uh, but yeah, I, I haven't tried it myself, but I've heard that it's, yeah, it's not great. <laughs> so, no. Uh -uh. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, lemonade crystal light, refrigerating it, using a straw to try and bypass the tongue. Those yeah. are all tips that I've uh, learned uh, help people, so. Could I ask a question, please? Yeah. Um, when a person, because of a mistake surgery, had a bowel reception, um, and there are a lot of adhesions from Another time also where um, peritonitis, I had peritonitis two times um, in my lifetime, once when I was younger and then um, in 2000, 99, 2000. How would you say they um, affect a colonoscopy now? I have pain daily, especially when the bowel moves. Um, the I've had the colonoscopies. Yeah, the adhesions or the uh, or the resection. Wh which part? Sorry. Um, probably both, but yeah. especially the the adhesions. Yeah, that could kind of contribute to it being a little trickier to navigate, um, but generally not, you know, um, impossible. But just it might be kind of a trickier, you know, more tortuous, as we say, colon. But. Um, yeah, it's, it's not impossible, and we definitely have had 
uh, patients where they've had a lot of, you know, surgeries um, in that region that they can get full colonoscopies, but it just may be a little bit, um, a little bit more technically difficult, but. I'm pretty sure the last time that they did put me to sleep yeah. and I am 68 now. I really don't want to risk. I mean, I feel like I saw a difference in my memory after that. Would there be anything else that they could do so that I don't risk um, you know, the, the, my memory being worth I am? I, I couldn't keep yeah. her. Yeah. yeah, that was, um, you kind of went in and out. I'm wondering if maybe uh, you could put it in the chat. I mean, I know this is personal information, but I'm not going to send anybody the chat, but that might be a way for us to be able to, quote unquote, hear your, your full question um, because it was breaking up. Or you could try turning off your video oh. and sometimes that increases your bandwidth for um, audio. I think you're frozen right now. Uh -oh. Yeah. Uh -oh. Okay. Well, I we'll go I ahead. Think part of the question, if I heard it right, was kind of whether like memory, if there's issues with memory and sedation. And um, to my knowledge, there's not a significant risk, especially with the type of sedation we're talking about with the colonoscopies. Um, but I don't know if there's zero risk, but um, it's thought to be pretty minimal um, because the propofol, like I mentioned, is pretty quick on, quick off, that kind of thing. So um, I think that was part of it. And so I may have missed more of the question though. That's the part I heard too. Yeah. I have, I have a question. Um, I had a uh, colonoscopy, uh, was, it didn't last very long because it was quickly came, ran into a kink. Oh yeah. And so, um, I went right over to have, while I was already cleaned out, to have an air contrast, very minima. Okay. How, how accurate are those? I, I'll, I don't recommend those. those that was a, <laughs> yeah. a once in a lifetime experience. Yeah, yeah, no, that doesn't sound uh, fun. So it was an air contrast, very minima, and not like the CT colonography. No, no, yeah. no, no. Those generally are not kind of in the recommendations now. Um, or ways to screen um, for, for uh, colon cancer. I'm not sure if it's fully because of accuracy or lack thereof, or if it's partially because of how, how uncomfortable it is, but um, it's not one of kind of the primary methods that are recommended at this time, yeah, so. Um, and can you tell me what, and you may have, I joined late, so you may have covered this, but why is there a cutoff at 70 or 75? Yeah, um, good question. So especially if people have been uh, screened pretty regularly before that, um, the risks are pretty low um, of a colon cancer developing kind of de novo um, after your last screening, um, because typically even if you have a polyp, uh, it will take 10 in even more usually time uh, 10 years or more uh, for that to develop into a cancer. So even on the order of like 20 years. So it just, it's kind of one of those things where you have to kind of weigh the risks and benefits of doing it. Um, and so I think 75, I, I don't know if there was kind of a, I'm sure they've done analyses where it was kind of the risk and benefit kind of mortality and that kind of thing. Um, but it's generally just recommended that you have that discussion with your doctor because, you know, as, as you all know, like some 75 year olds are in great shape and have very few medical problems and uh, can undergo a procedure and could withstand it if something were to happen. Um, but then um, other 75 year olds have a lot of chronic illnesses and their lifespan maybe, you know, five years or less. And so then it's, it's, is it worth putting somebody through the risk? Even if we find something, could something be done for this person? Like, could they go through a colon resection for cancer? Um, so it's all just kind of a risk benefit, but it has to do with overall health and kind of your prior screening history, family history, that kind of thing. But I think the, the benefits start to drop off um, after that, after that point, so. So with the air contrast, if it's not preferred now, I'm, I'm guessing it's because it wasn't as good at picking up. Yeah, I think that's at least part of it. And I think the other part is is what you were mentioning with um, it 
not being very uncomfortable. Um, so, um, but yeah, I don't know the exact statistics. I've not seen um, any of my patients having had that uh, recently. So yeah, but it's, it's not one of the recommended methods, um, I think for both of those reasons. Yeah. Okay. Did you? Yes. Um, I, ha I'm on, on a stage two and uh, my last colonoscopy was in, um, 2015, so it's been about six years. Um, I just received a letter telling me to fill out all this information and make an appointment. <laughs> and um, I, I did, they always find polyps. I've had several colonoscopies and they always find polyps, but they're never since, you know, serious. But I, they did tell me I had diverticulosis. Mm -hmm. And they just say eat a lot of fiber, which I always do. Yeah. So um, I tried to call and you can't call and talk to somebody in the office. Yeah. So hard, yeah. <laughs> they won't let you talk to anybody. So I don't know whether to, I don't want to go get another one, but I will if I have to. Yeah, I think that's definitely a, a conversation to have, um, yeah, with your doctor or your gastroenterologist who've done the procedures before. Um, they can probably give you more specific, uh, more specific recommendations. Yeah, like we said, it's always kind of a risk benefit um, analysis. So if you've had big or, or advanced polyps before, then it may be something where they think the benefits would outweigh the risk. But yeah, it's also always up to you as well, um, being the person that's getting the procedure done. Um, but yeah, certainly like other screening methods in your case, you know, in your case or someone in your situation um, where you've had polyps before wouldn't necessarily be be helpful um you know if it's negative we might not believe it um because you've had polyps before and if it's positive then you would be kind of sort of committed to doing a colonoscopy so yeah i think that's a good gray area uh question to kind of just my last one was like a vacation because my husband had surgery the next day oh and we had we had the uh, the the counseling for that the day ahead. So it was like a break for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a nap. A lot of people are very excited to get naps <laughs> uh, for their colonoscopies. So. <laughs> but I thought it was going to be the last and they said, see you in five years. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good one to yeah bring up and say, do I really need to do this? Or yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Lauren, we had a person ask oh. if you would be willing to share your, uh, your screen, your PDF, a PDF file of oh, the, your, your screen. So yeah. yeah, if you just want to email those to yeah. me and then um, that'd be great. If anybody sure. wants a copy, um, just email me if that's, thank you for that. Yeah, of course. They, it was Tommy said, just outstanding, loved it. Yeah. Such a delight to have such oh. a knowledgeable presenter mm -hmm. and we can still talk. I just wanted okay. to ask you that first. Sure. So. Yeah. Yeah. Before you forget it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm happy to send that. Dr. Carlini, this is a weird question now. Okay. I have had persistent C. diff yes. and um, have had a couple of transplants, yes. transplants, but uh, when I've been in most recently this year after Dr. Hayes left, weep, weep, <laughs> uh, and I was said they're not doing transplants, and I thought, well, okay. Hopefully I don't need one, but have you heard the latest scoop on that? I have not. That's a great question. Yeah, we, we don't know who's going to pick up the mantle uh, from Dr. Hayes in that regard. So, yeah, I think that's okay. very much uh, in, in motion, uh, in talks. So, yeah, I haven't heard. I'm not privy. Okay. <laughs> so it's a personnel issue rather than because they told me it was because of COVID and I thought, that's a weird response, but that, that wasn't the part, doctor's yeah. thing, by the way. Okay. <laughs> that might be part of it. It seems like it's affecting everything, but uh, I think it was... Yeah, that was kind of the wrong end of the body for that one. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, she was kind of a, a one-woman show in, in that regard, yeah. or at least from the GI standpoint. It's it's kind of a collaboration with infectious disease and that kind of kind of thing as well. But yeah, um, no, one, no one has taken that up as far as I know, so... Okay, thank you. Yeah. Carolyn, did you see Donna was back? Oh, yes, thank you. Donna, hi, can you, uh, let's see, I'll ask her to unmute herself. Thank you so much, Rennie. Yeah. Let's see. Um, Lauren, how many years do you have to do a residency program? 
Yeah, so I uh, graduated med school in 2016, so five years ago, and then I did I did my internal medicine residency. Uh, that was three years, and then gastroenterology fellowship is another three years. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was telling Carolyn before I'm going to be I'm a glutton for punishment, so I'm doing an additional year um, because I'm. Uh, going to do like liver transplant um, from the medicine Ooh. side, not from the surgery side, <laughs> uh, but taking care of people before liver transplant after they've had their surgery. Wow. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I've got two years left. <laughs> Quite the journey. Yes. Donna, Donna, did you want to try asking your question again? Let's see if we can hear you. Yes. I'm so sorry. It was my battery and I didn't realize it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Been so- um. I've had peritonitis twice in my life, once when I was young, once in 99, and sepsis. Um, Two-month hospital stay, and it was because of a surgical mistake. Um, Something was left in the abdomen two and a half years. So we couldn't find the problem until an x-ray was done, and then it showed up very clearly. But there's lots of adhesions, so much infection having gone on. Right. Um, there's pain every day. And a lot of times it is associated with a bowel movement. Mm-hmm. But um, they said that the colon or the bowel was tortuous. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't really want to be put to sleep like I think I was last time but the older I'm getting I'm hesitant about the sedation and memory effects and all yeah would there be anything that they might be able to do if I talk to them that I'm serious about the the connection of the two um as anything they could do as far as adjust what they would do for sedation or is that right i'm pretty sure i was out they said i need to be because of that history and all right yeah as far as i know there's not you know a a definite connection between the kind of sedation you get for at least for colonoscopy um and memory loss it's usually you know not always but i would say usually a 30 to 40 minute procedure so that's all in all not too much sedation and the propofol is pretty quick on and off um so as far as I know, there there is not a you know a definite connection with with memory loss or anything that we know of. Um, that being said, some people will um, I've I've experienced this once or twice where a brave soul will not want any sedation for their colonoscopy, um, which I don't think I I would do uh, necessarily, but to each their own. Um, with your history though, you know, and just kind of what you've what you've told me if it's torturous or kind of technically difficult, um, it could be a little more uncomfortable. So that you might not be a great candidate for the no sedation route, um, (laughs) (laughs) um, unless you're much braver than I am and have a much higher pain tolerance uh, than the average bear. But um, I'm thinking it might make it harder for the doctor too. Yeah. Looking at it. Right. Yeah. It is definitely helpful that you know, that patients are still and kind of comfortable during the procedure because we don't want to hurt anybody. And also, yeah, um, if we're doing something that requires very fine, you know, precision, then we definitely don't want people kind of moving um, at the wrong time. So, um, so yeah, generally, you know, if we do prefer some, some amount of sedation, but, you know, there are rare cases where we can strike a deal, so to speak. (laughs) um, (laughs) But yeah. All parties okay. have to be on, on the same page. So okay. kind of dependent on the person who's doing the procedure. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. One of the things that's really great about this talk, Dr. Carlini, is you've given us a lot of information that we can then ask informed questions to right. our primary care providers and our gastroenterologists. So I thank yeah. you for that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, like I say, I feel like, you know, doctors try to, to be, you know, to give people the pertinent information they need and, and mostly do a good job, but it's definitely helpful to have some amount of knowledge coming to the table. Um, and yes. especially with the advanced adenomas, that might not be something that was necessarily brought to people's attention before. And so just, yeah, <laughs> knowing what to look out for and knowing, yeah, 
to ask, is this advanced? Do I need to tell, talk to my family about getting screening earlier? That kind of thing. That's helpful too. So definitely. Yeah. Any last questions or comments for Dr. Carlini? Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you for your attention.